morning today. So I can leave this morning and we'll still be at the family. Hey, good morning. Well, what I'm just trying to do is make it easier for the reader.
Church here in Pottstown. Thank you to Pastor Leslie Richards for being here and leading us in our service today. And Janet, that was a little part of it. <laughs> Just a couple announcements. At the end of the day, the number is uh, incorrect. It should be 631 for the correct one. Uh, this week at Grace, we have prayer show on Tuesday evening. Uh, I have a note here from Brian. Uh, thank you to Rich for coming out this week, trim around the trim of the trees and cleaning out the undergrowth. Thanks to Dale and Roberta for coming out yesterday to move the grass and helping to clean it up. However, there's still more to be done. Work day is next Saturday with a hot dog social to follow. Uh, one last thing, uh, council will be voting tonight on the potential candidates, so please continue to keep everybody involved in this process in your prayers. Thank you. Please rise as you are able. Alleluia! Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. Alleluia. In the waters of baptism, we have passed over from death to life with Jesus Christ, and we are new, a new creation. For this saving mystery and for this water, let us bless God, who was, who is, and who is to come. We thank you, God for your river of life flowing freely from your throne, through the earth, through the city, through every living thing. You rescued Noah and his family from the flood. You opened wide the sea for the Israelites. Now in these waters you flood us with your mercy, and our sin is drowned forever. You opened the gate of righteousness, and we pass safely through. In Jesus Christ you calmed the trouble and trouble the waters. You nourish us and enclose us in safety. You call us forth and send us out. In lush and barren places, you are with us. You have become our salvation. Now, bathe, now breathe upon this water and awaken your church once more. Claim us again as your beloved and holy people. Quench our thirst. Cleanse our hearts, wipe away every tear. To you, our beginning and our end, our shepherd and our lamb, be honor, glory, praise, and thanksgiving, now and forever. Amen. Amen.
The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Let us pray. Bountiful God, you gather your people into your realm, and you promise us food from your tree of life. Nourish us with your word, that, empowered by your spirit, we may love one another and the world you have made. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. <clears throat> the first reading is from Acts. During the night, Paul had a vision. There stood a man of Macedonia pleading with him and saying, Come over to Macedonia and help us. When he had seen the vision, he immediately tried to cross over to Macedonia, being convinced that God had called us to proclaim the good news to them. We set sail from Troas and took a straight course to Samothrace the following day to Neapolis, and from there to Philippi, which is a leading city of the district of Macedonia and a Roman colony. We remained in this city for some days. On the Sabbath day, we went outside the gate by the river, where we were supposed to there, where we were supposed there was a place of prayer, and we sat down and spoke to the woman who had gathered there. A certain woman named Lydia, a worshiper of God, was listening to us. She was from the city of Thyatira, and a dealer in purple cloth. The Lord opened her heart to listen eagerly to what was said by Paul. When she, had, when she and her household were baptized, she urged us to say, If you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come and stay at my home. And she prevailed upon us the word of the Lord. And thanks be unto God. The second reading is from Revelation. And in the Spirit, one of the angels carried me away to a great high mountain and showed me the holy city of Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God. I saw no temple in the city, for its temple is the Lord God, the Almighty, and the Lamb. And the city had no need of sun or moon to shine on it, for the glory of God is its light, and its lamp is the Lamb. The nations will walk by its light, and the kings of the earth will bring their glory into it. Its gates will never be shut by day, and there will be no night there. People will bring into it the glory and the honor of the nations. But not the unclean will enter it, nor anyone who practices abomination or falsehood, but only those who are written in the Lamb's book of life. Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life, bright as a crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb through the middle of the street of the city. On either side of the river is the tree of life with its twelve kinds of fruit, producing its fruit each month, and the leaves of the tree are for the healing and the nations. Nothing accursed will be found there any more, but the throne of God and of the Lamb will be in, and the servants will worship him. They will see his face, and his name will be on their foreheads, and there will be no more night. They need no light or lamp or sun, for the Lord God will be their light, and they will reign forever and ever. The word of the Lord. May we honor Jesus together by standing together as we heard hear the gospel proclaimed. May I take off my mask? Thank you. The gospel is from the book of St. John. Glory to you, Lord. Jesus answered Judas, not Iscariot, Those who love me will keep my word, and my Father will love them, and we will come to them and make our home with them. Whoever does not love me does not keep my words, and the word that you hear is not mine, but is from the Father who sent me. <clears throat> I have said these things to you while I am still with you, but the Advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you everything and remind you of all that I have said to you. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. I do not give to you as the world gives. 
Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not let them be afraid. You heard me say to you, I am going away and I am coming to you. If you love me, you would rejoice that I am going to the Father because the Father is greater than I. And now I have told you this before it occurs so that when it does occur, you may believe. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. Please be seated. Now, my, my great strength is not, in fact, geography, but I do find geography to be something very intriguing when I take a, a moment to actually look at a map. We have this, this story about that, that begins in Acts around Paul and Silas and Timothy. Now, this is not the beginning of their journey. They've been on the road for some time, and it's not the first time, certainly, that Paul has taken uh, a journey around the, uh, the many cities and towns around the Great Sea. But it so happens that, that Paul and his entourage have been kind of stalled along the way because they thought, that they were in a great position maybe to start evangelizing to the east. But the Holy Spirit said, no, don't go east, stay where you are. And they thought, well, what about the south? We can go south. The Holy Spirit said, no, that's not my intent. North? So they sat and they waited. And I don't know how long they waited, but it was some time and one night, finally, in a dream, Paul has a vision. It's a vision of a man over in Macedonia. And, and, and by the way, that's across the Aegean Sea from where they are, right? That's my little bit of geography. <laughs> Calling to them and saying, come help. Please, please, come help. So, Paul as, as the vision ends, goes, and he tells his companions, and they say, ah, at last, we know what we're supposed to do. We're going to board a boat, and we're going to sail into Macedonia, <clears throat> which is what they do immediately. As soon as it's light, they go running over to, to the port, and they get on a boat, and the next day they get on another boat, and, you know, within... Two or three days, it seems, that they arrive at the destination that they had in mind, the city of Philippi. Now, this vision didn't say specifically where in Macedonia. Macedonia is really big, um, and it, you know, it covers um, a portion of, of what is today Greece, and in that day, I think Yugoslavia, well, I'm sorry, what used to be Yugoslavia, and now we have um, now we have Northern Macedonia. See, I'm learning, I'm learning a little bit about the world. But just to give you an idea, it's a big, big place. So, to go to Philippi, which is one of the major cities in Macedonia, seemed like a really good idea. So, I don't know what they did for those first few days. Um, maybe settled in, maybe scanned the city getting the lay of the land. Maybe they started meeting people and spreading some of the gospel. I don't know what they did. <clears throat> but we do know what they did when the Sabbath day came. They went down to the river to pray. Hear the song playing in your head already? They went down to the river to pray. Now, how would they know to do that? Well, as it turned out, that would be a pretty regular practice that in, in communities where you can't find a synagogue, you'd know if you were a Jewish person or, or a non-Jewish person who worships the God of the Israelites, you meet at the river. So there's always an appointed meeting spot. So that's where they go. Well, I have to say that the book of Acts is filled with surprises 
And in some ways that shouldn't surprise us at all because it's really a book about the acts of the Holy Spirit. And you can't possibly anticipate what the Spirit is actually going to do. So when they go, the men go down there to the river, there is a group of women who are gathered here to pray. That might have been a little surprising. Where are the men? I don't know. But one of the things that it suggests is that there are so few worshipers in this vast city of Philippi that you're looking at this small handful of faithful women. And you could also imagine that, that Paul and his companions are, are thinking, you know, our, our usual practice is that we go into a town or a city and we worship at the synagogue. And there's usually a community, but here it's there are so few that this is all we have. So they sit down and begin to speak to the women. And they are telling them about, about Jesus. And one in particular is leaning in and really listening with all her being. This is the woman we come to know as Lydia. Now Lydia is a bit of a surprise also, I would think, for, for the, these, these Jewish believers in Christ who are sitting across from a woman who is an independent woman. Independent. Because remember when I said, where are the men? That includes a husband. Apparently, there's no one there. This woman is rare. A rare sight, I think, for, for Paul and Silas and Timothy. She is a self-made woman who is a, has a business that is so lucrative that she can be out on her own. As a matter of fact, she is also an immigrant. Because this is, Philippi is not where she's from. She is from uh, another part of, the, of, of Macedonia altogether. But when you look, when you look at your map and you see that she is in Philippi, and um, I'm going to try to pronounce it Thyatira. Yes, sounds good. All right, thank you. Say again. Learning my geography. Other on two sides of of the of this sea, different points. She probably has a monopoly, or at least a pretty tight control, on a very specific market. You see that she is. <laughs> You familiar with that? And I'm going to remind you, even if you are familiar with what that means, is that that uh, in the ancient world, you know, that make the dyeing of cloth is is a, a pretty um, specialized trade, and to be able to dye purple cloth, you need a source for it. And there, along the shore of the Aegean Sea, it just happens to be that there is a snail or a mollusk that produces a particular kind of ink in its body. And you need a lot of them to be able to produce a piece of fabric. Now, what I, what I was reading, that by having a big leaden pot full of snails on the boil for several days, how do you think that smells? <laughs> right. I mean, it's, just, it's, it's a terrible thing. But what it produces is, is the richest, deepest purple. And it's so difficult to, to gather that it is so very expensive to own. So only the very wealthiest people of the community could possibly afford this product. Now, I also learned that, that in January of 2021, so just a year and a half ago, it was discovered 
for the first time, archaeologists actually found a piece of uh, textile with this kind of purple uh, dye in it. And when I looked at the picture, it was absolutely astounding. I was looking for a purple in this room that would match it, and there is not a purple as deep as this one. And for 3,000 years, this color has lasted in these fibers. It is astounding. So you can see why it would be so very desirable. And again, if Lydia is in on two points here along the sea coast, it could very well be that she manages the whole thing, or at least she has two important manufacturing centers. So what else is kind of surprising about this woman? Well, uh, she is a Roman, so, hmm. Well, Paul has Roman citizenship as well. So they do have something in common, but how do these Jewish preachers sit down with a woman who is about as opposite from them as you can get? And somehow, it does happen. They begin to tell the story and the message and the God of the gospel of Jesus Christ, that God himself has come into the world to overcome sin and death and evil and to show his power over those things and that he is the savior of the world. And it was not the power of that preaching because, you know, as much as I would love to imagine that, you know, in our preaching we can be, you know, so marvelous. It was not the power of the preaching, but the movement of the Holy Spirit that opened up Lydia's heart so that she could receive every bit of it and demand, beg, plead, will you baptize me? Will you baptize my household? Will you give us this gift, please? And seeing that movement of the Holy Spirit within her, Paul, Silas, Timothy, they couldn't say no to that. They were baptized. Now the next surprising thing, when you think about it, is that then Lydia says, now come and stay at my house. You want us to do what now? Because again, all the all the traditions, all the learning, all the experiences that these men have had in their background had not prepared them for this. So now we have we are being invited to stay in the home of a woman, of a woman, not of a man, who has a business in, in, in something that for them would be unclean because it's a food that you certainly would not eat of snails or mollusks. Bottom feeders, you know, you avoid bottom feeders if you can. And think about her clients. This woman is connected to so intricately and intimately into the hierarchy of Roman society. It is very possible that she might even have met the emperor himself because she may have clothed him. What? That's the house that you're going to go stay in? I imagine that they're a little surprised. And they may have been wondering, what are we doing here? But here is the place where the Holy Spirit has brought them. And the surprise that, oh, when you say Macedonia, it's not just some guy in a dream, in a vision. But it is this hungry heart. And it doesn't matter how it's embodied. This hungry heart who longs for Jesus. This is why we're here. Well, let's also turn the story just a little bit and see it from Lydia's perspective. 
as I mentioned, you know, there, there's probably not a synagogue in the city, or certainly not anywhere in her portion of the city. And she probably knows everybody who's everybody. But she has been worshiping the God of the Israelites for probably much of her life. She may have chosen this in her adulthood as her desire. And so, to be gathered with like-minded people in prayer is a necessity. Not only a good thing, but a necessity. And to one day, out of the blue, have these three men appear on the riverbank alongside of her. It must have been a great surprise. She may have been wondering, what are you doing here? Not upset, not, not angry, but bewildered. Because, you know, uh, <clears throat> that, 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 that your land is pretty far to the east of here. You know? That we don't usually see your, your people here this far into the Roman territory, this far close to Rome. What are you doing here? You know, that's a question that, that echoes through Scripture. What are you doing here? That's a question that, that uh, do you remember God asked Adam and Eve when they had gone and taken the fruit from the tree and then they hid themselves? And God questioned them, what are you doing here? What are you doing in the bushes? What's going on? Where are you? Right? It, it, it's a question that also was asked of, of, of Elijah, the prophet, when he ran for his life from Jezebel, when he was the only one left who was a priest of the Lord. And when he hid under a bush, and then when God directed him to go into that cave where he eventually got to hear that still, small voice, that still, small voice asked that same question, what are you doing here, Elijah? And that is the question that is asked by God and by God's people. What are you doing here? A very important and evocative question. Because here's one more place where the question was asked. Now remember what season we're in? It's, it, we're in the sixth week of it now. And that's okay, say it out loud. Thank you, we're in Easter. And it was only, only actually about five weeks ago when we heard, I mean we're in the sixth week, but five weeks ago, that we heard the story of the empty tomb. You see where I'm going? What's the question that is asked at the empty tomb? What are you doing here? That's right. What are you doing here? Do you remember? There, there, in, in one version, we have an angel ask it. You know, an angel perhaps, perhaps, you know, with a Latin voice. I don't know what the, what the tone would be, but what are you doing here? I mean, Jesus isn't here. He's risen, just as he said. And he's gone ahead of you. So go, go, tell Tell everybody what you see and what's happening. What's happened here? And we're also very familiar with, with Mary, who in, in a version of the story is all alone. And seeing someone who she perceives to be the gardener, and he wants to know, what are you doing? What are you doing here? Because she's weeping and looking in the tomb. What are you doing? And it's not until he says her name, Mary, that all of a sudden it comes to her. She understands. The spirit opens up all the wisdom inside of her to recognize, oh, this is why I'm here. Because you're here, Lord. That's why I'm here. So, that question, that Easter question that echoes back to the very beginning of creation. What are you doing here?
listen to that question. That's a lonely question. It can mean so many things. It can mean why, why have you wandered into a place that is full of danger and death for you? What are you doing here? It could be the kind of question that a prodigal son might ask himself when finally he starts to realize, oh, what, what have I done to myself, to my life, to my family, to, to all the things entrusted to me? And how can I possibly go on with it? What am I doing here? Now, when a prodigal comes home, we hear in that parable that Jesus told us, that is not the question that the father asks him. The father doesn't ask him anything. When he asks himself that question and brings himself home, expecting to be questioned like that, instead the father surprises him by wrapping him in an embrace and clothing him with all the symbols of a son, of a child, to say welcome home and to call him by name. So, this intriguing story of Paul and Silas and Timothy and Lydia and all the other unnamed women gathered there on the riverbank, they evoke that question, what are you doing here? And I ask that you hold that question before you throughout the day, and perhaps in days to come. What are you doing here? So you can let that echo. Do you need to come home? Do you need to come back from a place that's not healthy, safe, or well for you? Do you ask, can you ask that word of, of question what are you doing here of someone else who may take you by surprise by calling you by name and calling you into fellowship? What? Such an, such an unexpected opportunity. But what if that's somebody that doesn't look like you or believe what you believe or from the same land that you're from? Now listen to that invitation. Because you may be able to call one another by name. Because that's what you're listening for. Are you my brother or are you my sister? Can I get to know you by our family name as, 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 as children of God? That is some of the beauty of this Easter season. What are you doing here? Or say it with words of wonder, wow, what are you doing here? I didn't think you'd come. But this is what the Spirit does. I'm so glad you're here. Grace and peace to you from God our Father, to our Lord and Savior.
Levites as you are eating. With the whole church, let us confess our faith. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Set free from captivity to sin and death, we pray to the God of resurrection for the Church, people in need, and all of creation. God of new life, open your church to the unexpected ways of your spirit that who is at work. Guide bishops, pastors, deacons, and lay leaders in their visioning, partnership, and planning. Be certainly with this congregation as the council prepares for its discerning decision tomorrow evening on a new candidate. Surround us all with your peace. God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Give a vision of increase and abundant harvest for farmers, laborers, and gardeners who are beginning their growing season. Join their efforts with the goodness of creation to feed all living things. God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Shine your light of wisdom and peace among nations. When those in power seek to assert dominance over others, confound their ways and make them yield to your humble authority. God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Give safe haven to those who seek healing, liberation, or peace. Especially today, we lift up before you the, 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 the people of Ukraine and for all refugees everywhere who seek peace and security. But we also lift before you those in need of ongoing prayer for Angel and Ashia, for Butch and Debbie, for Chase, Cindy, Dottie, and Rachel, for Jim and Tabby and Heidi, for Grace and Sammy and Herta, for George and Kim, for George Smith, for Roman, for Helene and Hannah, for Patricia, for Linda, and, and as we continue to lift up those who are homebound, for Anna Mae, for Arlene, Barbara, for Barbara Ham and Sharon, for Julia, for Daisy and Joyce, for Renee and Joyce Works, and for all others that we lift before you, either in our hearts or on our lips. Okay. Create places filled with hospitality where hurting people find your loving presence and wholeness. God, in your mercy. You are my Uphold the work of ministries and organizations in our communities who assist people experiencing homelessness, citizens returning from prison, and all marginalized people. We also lift our prayers for those who are in prison and for <coughs> that, that, that safety and security may be granted to them openly. Accomplish your will through, through the efforts of ministries. God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Assemble your people at rivers, streams, and fonts where we remember our baptism and welcome others into the communion of saints. Gather us with those who have died, especially those who we lift before you in our hearts, so that when we meet together, we are together at your river of life. God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Into your mercy, O God, respond to these prayers and renew us by your life-giving spirit. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Please be seated.
Let us pray. Living God, you gather the wolf and the lamb to feed together in your peaceable reign, and you welcome us all at your table. Reach out to us through this meal and show us your wounded and risen body that we may be nourished and believe in Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread and gave thanks, broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup and he gave thanks. And he gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. The risen Christ dwells with us here. All who are hungry, all who are thirsty, come. The body of Christ, given for you. The blood of Christ, shed for you. May the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace. Amen. We give you thanks, generous God, for this bread and cup we have, for in this bread and cup we have tasted the new heaven and new earth, where hunger and thirst are no more. Send us from this table as witnesses to the resurrection, that through our lives all may know life in Jesus' name. Now see, receive the Lord's benediction. Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, bless you now and forever. Amen.
what God has done. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Happy Easter. Happy Easter.